I want to share with you a message that I will call it keep Lord in God keep Lord in God Genesis chapter 3 the famous temptation story the first temptation story the first of many things happened in Genesis 3 the first sin the first um, mention of curse the first um, man blaming his wife not the last one though but it's the first one uh, wife blaming the devil also not the last one and not only wife but other people blaming the devil so a lot of first things we see the first mention of the serpent coming into the picture a lot of the first things and I want to read just one verse the first verse of chapter 3 now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field whom the Lord God somebody say Lord God, Lord God. somebody say the Lord God whom the Lord God had made and he said to the woman has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden so we know in the first two chapters of the book of the Bible we see that God makes the the earth he then makes it really beautiful he makes humans in it and then he puts them in the garden called the garden of Eden now for us the Garden of Eden we know that it's somewhere where the turkey is somewhere in that area but the Garden of Eden was more than just a nice garden where God had beautiful plants beautiful trees and beautiful fruits the Garden of Eden tells us in other scriptures it lets us know when you read between the lines that the Garden of Eden was not just the dwelling place of Adam and Eve the Garden of Eden was God's office his spiritual dwelling place as well in fact it was so common in the garden of Eden for God to walk through the garden the Bible says that when serpents showed up and most of us when we think of a serpent we think of a hissing snake this wasn't a hissing snake in fact we see in in Ezekiel chapter 18 it refers to the devil in the garden and look what it says about him you were in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was your covering you were the anointed cherubim who covers I established you you were on the holy mountain of God still talking about the Eden you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stone so I want you to switch your mind of how you think about the garden of Eden this is not a Satan the snake this is a cherubim coming to go to to Adam and Eve this is somebody who has stones on him this is a spiritual being that appears in the garden and Eve is not freaked out like for example if I see a snake or some kind of a being I'll freak out we see people in the, in the New Testament you know the angel showed up in the temple and and Ezekiel and Zechariah and others were like scared whoa whoa she wasn't scared that tells us it was common for Adam and Eve to interact with spiritual beings they were making appearances regularly the world of God and the world of men was together God had his home office his entourage in the garden he had a spiritual family and God made a physical family how do we know that God had a spiritual family because we see these references let us make men now a lot of times people refer to this saying that that's God speaking to the three persons of the Trinity but three persons of the Trinity are God they don't need to know anything that they don't know they're omniscient they know everything God does not need to ask the Son the Son does not need to ask the Spirit they know everything so this is not referring to many scholars believe to the Trinity this is referring to God's what they call God's console or God's spiritual family that God was around where God is asking them let us make man in our image and likeness then we see more where Adam sinned God says let us they now know what we know and let's kick them out of garden and then God puts one of his spiritual beings as a security guard a watchman in the garden and a sword around the garden when Adam and Eve you know they passed away their descendants had the flood etc and they build a tower then God says let us come down and see what they build you must say who are these us we see more verses in the scripture in 1st Kings 22 verse 19 it says I saw the Lord sitting on his throne this is way later 
and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left hand. God's world is so unique our minds cannot comprehend. In book of Revelation we see living creatures, we see elders, we see thrones, not just the throne, we see different thrones. So God has an entourage, God has an office, God has a staff, God has a spiritual family and we see in book of Genesis when God makes the earth he creates the garden and these two worlds were very close to each other. Most likely they bridge together. God's spiritual family and God's earthly family made of Adam and Eve. It was common for Adam and Eve to interact with spiritual beings. Therefore when one of them came and started to talk to Eve, Eve did not freak out. Eve did not run. Eve did not panic and Eve did not scream. The world that God created, both of the worlds were together. God's assignment for Adam and Eve was to take this beautiful union between humanity and eternal God all around the globe to spread the Garden of Eden, to make babies so that there's more children and that they could rule and reign on this earth along, under, with their Creator God. Of course, we know what happened. Chapter 3 happened. This being, this spiritual being came to Adam and Eve and some people say, well a lot of people who are studying the Bible for living, Hebrew, Greek and all of that stuff, they're saying this is when the devil rebelled. He had a problem with God having other children, other family. He had a problem that God entrusted them with rulership on earth and he was jealous. He wanted to be the only one and he went and undermined God's authority and talking to Eve he started to, I want you to see the beginning of the temptation and that's what this whole message is going to be about. In chapter 2 of Genesis you will see this phrase. If you read very carefully I want you to pay attention. It says this, the Lord God the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. It mentions the Lord God, Genesis 2-4, Genesis 2-5, Genesis 2-7, Genesis 2-8, Genesis 2-9, Genesis 2-15, Genesis 2-16, Genesis 2-18, Genesis 2-19, Genesis 2-21, Genesis 2-22 and Genesis 3-1. It's exactly what we read. The Lord God, the Lord God. See God was not just the maker, He was also Lord. Meaning everything on the earth was his possession. He was the owner and everything was submitted under his rulership. I want you to notice how the devil starts the question. Has God said? He takes the Lord out. And how does Eve respond back? She says, yes God said. She takes the Lord out as well. Before Eve fell with eating the fruit she stepped out from under the Lordship of her God. Keep the Lord in God. Meaning Satan does not come to make Eve an atheist. Satan doesn't mind that you have a religion or you believe in God. In fact if you don't believe in God you believe in something and you have a religion. Atheism is, atheism is a religion. I know they're saying it's a science. It's not a science. It's religion. You have to believe in something you can't prove. It's still a religion. So Satan does not mind if you have a religion. He did not come to Eve and question the existence of God the Creator. He came and his first beginning of his whole thing is this. There is a God. He's not my Lord. He shouldn't be your Lord either. It's when Satan can get the Lord out of God. He got you on the hook. After that, it's just a matter of time. It depends on what really you will take a bite of. Some of us it's drugs, some of us it's alcohol, some of us it's immorality, some of us it's honestly success, it's pride. Different bait for a different person. But the first thing where he knocks the wind out of us is this, has God said? Has God said? God wants to be your Lord. He is Lord of heaven and the earth. 
and our life ought to be submitted to him as Lord not just as God can somebody say amen Lord yes Lord if you remember the story of the last supper when Jesus is saying somebody is going to betray me and disciples in Matthew 26 22 say this one after another said is it I Lord I want you to notice disciples relationship with Jesus Lord is it I I want you to notice the reference see we're using word Lord we don't have Lords and somebody who claims to be Lord should should see a doctor it's not good because word Lord means you own word Lord means honestly absolute submission to that Lord so if somebody walks around I know the Bible says that Sarah called Abraham Lord um, I don't know what she meant by that but like that, that's, that's a pretty huge word okay so if you call your husband Lord you just means you his like property okay not really good for your marriage but hey it makes him probably feel good <laughs> when your boss calls you you know he calls himself Lord that means he owns you that that that's prohibited in America that's illegal that's slavery so when a human being calls himself Lord we, we get this special Americans who got our independence from Great Britain like we're like heck no no I'm gonna fight I got guns I got like first amendment rights second amendments I got amendments I got constitution so we don't like anybody ruling over us because the last thing we need is a tyrant and so when we think of God we think is God is a buddy I can go to Wendy's with Jesus and I we're chill we're homies we got this really amazing relationship but I want to destroy that today because Jesus became too familiar to a lot of us Jesus is not your buddy he is God and he is Lord and disciples is not saying hey is it I buddy they're saying is it I Lord so though they've been with him for three years they did not become so familiar where he lost the Lordship now did they make mistakes oh you bet did they betray him did they forsook him yeah they made a lot of mistakes but I want you to notice between them and Judas because then Jesus looks at Judas and this is what Judas replies to Jesus so disciples said is it I Lord and Judas says Judas who would betray him answered is it I Rabbi you're not my Lord never been never will be but you are my teacher therefore I can sell you out but see when he's your Lord you can fall and trip you're still gonna be under his covering you're still gonna repent you're gonna still come back see it's that relationship it's why Jesus had the audacity to call Judas the devil why is he the devil because the devil was the first person who said God without Lord the devil's number one task is to make you religious and remove your relationship to the Lordship of God and if maybe just tweak it miss it I know we live in a democracy I know we don't have Lords we got a president he's in in four years we can't wait for him to finish his course and get out another guy will come in we we like him for six months we don't like him after that for three and a half years presidents they make promises they don't keep politicians are like diapers you gotta switch them constantly for the same reason because they're you give them too much power they don't know what to do with it they mess up they're humans and that's normal God forbid if we will make our president previous one or this one Lord we would definitely have to go to Canada or other places because give them too much power they'll destroy give your husband all the power give your child all the power give anybody none of us can handle that power but there is somebody who is the creator there's somebody who this power doesn't go into his head he's not corrupt he doesn't have beginning he doesn't have the end and he's not just God over the planet distant like Thanos he just simply snaps his fingers and he got his rings by crushing everybody's planet no he actually made everything he created everything and he wanted the humans to be part of his physical family I remember reading a book this week and I would recommend you it called Supernatural by Dr. Michael Heiser and he had this phrase there that ministered to me so well I even shouted before I went to sleep and my wife said hey what did you read I said no you have to read it yourself to discover the truth but then she bribed me into sharing that with her as well 
and this is the phrase that he said he said people say why can't God just remove evil just click delete trash empty the trash can start all over for God to remove evil he would have to remove two of his families his spiritual family because that's where the corruption started with the devil and he would have to remove his physical family that's where the corruption also started the earthly family Adam and Eve and also you and I included if he would remove both of those families that means that his plan to rule the planet and the universe through his family was a mistake and he doesn't make mistakes this might not satisfy your longing for that answer but God could remove it the only way he can remove it is to remove you remove me and remove the devil remove everybody but God that would mean that God made a mistake by having this plan of involving us in reaching and spreading his message on the earth and God does not make mistakes I want to encourage you today that the Lord our God wants to be our Lord amen the second thing that I want to highlight and that is today the enemy will not maybe remove the Lord out of God he will settle for empty confession without full practice of Lordship Jesus said that in Matthew 7 21 not everyone who say Lord Lord Luke chapter 6 verse 46 it says why do you call me Lord Lord but you don't do what I tell you Today the devil is okay with you calling God Lord as long as it's not backed up with your life. As long as just an empty word. I don't know if you ever seen those um, people who put an apple and attach it to their PC computer and make it an Apple computer. Ever seen it? You ever seen somebody cut out a Mercedes emblem and stick it on the Toyota? You, you ever seen it? I, I've, I've seen it. I've seen somebody print a Starbucks cup and uh, tape it with the tape on their cup. I've seen somebody take a Rolex, cut out just a piece, a piece, piece of um, a printed Rolex and, and stick it, just tape it on their, on their watch. Now, if you see those things, they're funny. But you know that that's not real. So this is what Jesus is addressing in the New Testament. He's saying that not everyone who prints Lord, Lord and sticks it on whatever they're doing now is the one that's actually obeying the will of my Father. Jesus is saying is this is just a fake Lordship meaning you can profess it without possessing it you can profess it without surrendering and so the dilemma that happens in the generation today is people who claim the Lordship of Jesus Christ but they don't live their lives surrendered they barely go to church they barely open the Bible they don't give they don't serve they don't participate in anything and they simply say Lord Lord and some of them they can even have some spiritual gifts like Bible says this the Bible says this that some of them can prophesy they can heal the sick but my friend the question is not can you prophesy the question is not can you heal the sick the question is not even do you know the Christian lingo the question is can you talk to Christianese the question is not that the question is that have you been doing the will of your father to do his will means you have to yield your own I'm not talking about agreeing with God on the things you agree with God like bless me heal me deliver me I'm talking about when your wills clash you say Lord not my will but your will be done that is living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ that is living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ come on touch your neighbors to keep the Lord in God Jesus cannot be my Savior if He is not my Lord. The Bible says that in Acts chapter 16 verse 31, it says the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is required for salvation. Have you noticed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Not in Jesus Christ but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation has become come to the front, pray a prayer, mean it from the bottom of the heart and please understand we'll do that again today but I want to warn every person who thinks that you can just print a sticker pray a prayer without death to your will I'm not talking about death to your sin I'm not talking about death to your problems I'm not talking about death to your heartbreak I'm talking about death to your will to do his will you have to give up yours 
Jesus is not wanting to be nobody's fire insurance. He says, I am either Lord of all or I am not at all. He wants to be your Lord and only one worthy to be qualified of that title. Jesus has to be Lord if he wants to be, if you want to make him your savior. That's what the Bible says. That means I can't accept him as savior and reject him as Lord. There's no such a thing. You take him as your savior and you take him as your Lord. Christianity is very dangerous in the sense that you lose your life to get his. You give your life to him and you acknowledge what does that mean when he is your Lord? It means three things. I acknowledge his ownership. Somebody say ownership. That means I belong to him. I'm not like a property to the Lord but I am his priceless possession. I'm not a property. God doesn't play with me like with a napkin. Use me and throw me out. No, God treats me like a price, like a, like a peril of a great price. I, I'm precious to him. But nevertheless, I am his possession. That means that you are owned by him. You're already owned by him. But you choose to acknowledge that. Number two, having the lordship of God means absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. We don't like things that we own that don't listen to us. Like even if you have a pet and that pet don't listen to you. You're like, man, I bought you. I gave you a medical shot. I put a chip inside of you. I am your Lord. I feed you. You wouldn't even know where to get food without me. I care for you, you little four-legged animal. And you're giving me an attitude and I can sell you as fast as I bought you. We don't like it. Now of course some of those things they need to be trained but I want to tell you something. The Lord wants to have absolute surrender. When you buy a car and your car has a mind of its own, you're gonna get rid of that car very soon. You will go to a mechanic, you will sell it on Copart or something but you're gonna be like I am not gonna drive something that does not listen to me and want to drive itself. I mentioned the story one time when I bought this Audi off of Craigslist in Portland. Very bad decision and uh, this Russian guy that was selling me he wasn't even there. His wife sold it to me and uh, I, I started I didn't even know how to start Audi because you don't start it like this you have to push the key in so I had to YouTube on how to start an Audi because I've never had an Audi and so it was an older uh, off of the auction and so I pushed that in and it made it <laughs> so I thought it was turbo his wife told me like well that's turbo and so um okay sounds good I've never had a turbo so I have a car with the turbo and Audi and I was driving one time one time after morning prayer going to the gold's gym and right here on the on the churn the car decided to accelerate when I was pressing brakes. Like a mind of its own. That turbo turned on, it starts going so fast on the red light. Thankfully I pulled the e-brakes, pulled the key out, came to a stop and I took it to a mechanic literally the same day and I said listen you need to fix this. Why? This thing doesn't listen to its owner. It does not have absolute surrender. Therefore I can't have it use it until it learns there's only one boss and it's not it it's me now i understand it's a car we're not a car we're humans we're made in the image and likeness of god but when you acknowledge his lordship you want to be used of him you have to be absolutely surrendered god won't use you like you use the car but he wants to know you're fully surrendered the third meaning of surrender of lordship is willingness to serve is you are willing to serve his purposes and you're willing to serve his goals and his agenda there's a story i've shared it with our tribe on monday that it's been my verse for this season of my life i want to read it with you right now if you have your bible let's go to second samuel chapter 15 and verse 25 and 26 that's a the other portion of the Bible that I'm going to read today. 2 Samuel chapter 15, 25 and 26. This comes when David is out of Israel. His son Absalom went bananas and um, decided to declare himself to be a king. A king. He had a lot of good people around him so he felt like that validates him to be a king. His dad is too old. He doesn't know what he's doing and so 
he's moving to Jerusalem to take over the throne. David, instead of creating a fight, he decides to step back and walk away from the throne. Verse 25, then king said to Zadok, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, I want you to notice how David sees God, the Lord. In fact, it's later on, he gives a messianic prophecy. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, He's talking about two lords. He says, the Lord said to my Lord, and Jesus used that prophecy to confuse the Pharisees. And he said, who was David talking about? He said, whose Lord was he talking to when he was talking about his Lord? And he totally messed up the Pharisees because it simply meant that God had a son and it simply meant that there is, you know, God the Father and there is God the Son. But I want you to notice the relationship David has with God. He says, if I find the favor in the eyes of the Lord, He's not just his God. To David, yes, I'm a king. Yes, I call the shots. Yes, I'm the guy in charge. But listen, I have a God who is my Lord. He says, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. Verse 26. This is the key verse. If he says thus, I have no delight in him. Here I am let him do to me as seems good to him mic drop right there are you kidding me do you remember his predecessor when God came to Saul and said Saul you're fired you've been disobedient to me and Saul got so addicted to the throne he got so addicted to the privileges that came with the throne he loved his entourage he loved that fact that he had the palace he had everybody obeying him but God's like Saul you, you, you're done here and Saul said no I'm gonna hold on to this in here we see David is walking out from the throne God is not telling David to leave the throne David is seeing a problem his son is about to make a big mess a lot of blood will be spilled he's like I don't want this to happen and what David does is that David walks away from the throne he meets Zadok and Zadok's like we got the ark of God man let's go David like the old times me ark and then we're just gonna go fight it and Absalom's gonna die and David says take the ark back inside it belongs in Jerusalem and he says if God if I find favor in the eyes of God, he says, I'll be back. He'll show me the ark. He'll show me his dwelling place. Everything will be fine. And then David throws this thing. He says, if God for some reason unknown to me says, I no longer delight in David. I don't find pleasure in him. Honestly, I don't like him. David says, this is what I'm going to do. I don't know if he will say that or not, but in case he does, I want you to Zadok to know my response. I won't go crazy. I won't fight for the throne. I will say this, here I am. Do to me what seems good to you. Put me back in the shepherd's field. Do whatever you want with me. Why? Because you're my Lord. I am their king but you are my Lord. God never said I have no delight in David. God never said you should not be a king but David's response was this Lord here I am Isaiah said here I am send me God comes to Ananias and says go to see Saul and, and Ananias says here I am Lord I'm gonna do what you want me to do God comes to Abraham and says Abraham sacrifice your son and Abraham said here I am Lord God comes to Jacob and he says here I am Lord and God comes to David in a premeditated version not physically but David is already assuming in case he comes and he said David you are fired David you've done too much bad David you lost your job as a king David I have no delight in you and David is already have a pre-made answer here I am do to me what seems good to you my friend I want to challenge you to live with this position in your heart here I am do to me what seems good to you I know we know God's will to heal but if something does not happen as you want it, here I am. Do good to me as it seems good to you. I know that we know God's promise to deliver, but I want you to have a posture in your heart. Here I am. Do to me as it seems good to you. I know it's God's will for you to get married, but here I am. Do to me as it seems good to you. It is God's will to prosper you, but have this posture. Here I am. Do to me as it seems good to you. 
I know God says he will give you children and your children will possess the gates of your enemies but you have to have a posture here I am do to me as it seems good to you I know that God has given you a prophetic word and a prophetic dream of your future but if things take a route that is different than what you expected here I am do to me what it seems good to you I know God calls you into ministry but God wants you to have a posture here I am do to me as it seems good to you do to me as it seems good to you do to me as it seems good to you Lord I surrender to you Lord I yield my ministry to you Lord I yield my children to you Lord I yield my life to you Lord I lead, lead my body to you Lord do to me what seems good to you if you want to take me through the fire I am yours if you want to take me to the top I am yours if you want to show in me an example of suffering Lord do to me as it seems good to you now my will be done but your will be done God eventually brought David back to the throne God eventually established David's throne but God wants you to have this posture in your heart here I am do to me what seems good to you this does not mean that you don't fight for what God has given to you this does not mean that you don't fight for your healing this does not mean that you don't fight for your family it just means you have a posture in your heart between you and God God I belong to you God you're my owner God you are my owner I belong to you I give you absolute surrender God do to me what seems good to you we want our ministry to grow and touch the world but what if it doesn't happen how I expected my response here I am do to me as it seems good to you I remember I even came to Pastor Eli and said Eli I want you to lead the church I want to serve you he's like no my response now to do the things of ministry when it comes to leading the church preaching is Lord here I am do to me what seems good to you and if God if you don't fight pleasure and you want me to step down and do something else God I will say here I am do to me as it seems good to you I'm not saying I achieved the posture of David but I want to be like David in this regard when God gave David a promise that he will be a king David has so many opportunities to cut, take the shortcut but he didn't do it. Why? Because his posture is God. Here I am. Do to me as it seems good to you. When God says I'll give you an enemy you can do whatever you want with it and then that enemy was Saul. He went to urinate in the cave and one of the brothers of David reminded David and said remember the promise that Samuel or other prophets gave you that God will finally make the enemy put him into your hands and you can do to him whatever you want and you, you can just take him out right now and then you'll become a king all the promises will come true God gave you the green light and David just cut the robe of Saul and even then he felt bad because David wouldn't take a shortcut to David it wasn't about the throne it wasn't about the promise to David it was not about it was about making sure his Lord is pleased with his servant make sure that his Lord now make sure my stock portfolio is good now make sure my reputation is doing good now make sure everybody talks good about me now make sure my following is good now make sure I have the best army now make sure that I have the best position and the best perks now make sure of them I make sure my Lord is pleased with his servant here I am do to me what seems good to you pray that prayer it's a scary prayer because you're surrendering your rights but I want to tell you something God is not a monster he's not a Pharaoh he's not a pilot he's not a Herod he's not a Hitler he doesn't take advantage of people this doesn't mean you surrender to your sickness this doesn't mean you surrender to a special needs child or you, you you surrender to the situation that you can't control this simply means you take everything that you're going through and you surrender it to the sovereignty of your Lord it doesn't mean you don't know whether he wants to heal you or not you do know he wants to heal you because he made it clear but sometimes there are situations like Absalom sometimes there is situation like happening in your life you have no explanation for what do you do you posture your heart and you say here I am do to me what seems good to you brothers and sisters who are going in the 1040 window right now some of them who are watching and who are honestly losing their job some of them who are losing their relationships some of them who will be shipped to different camps and prisons because of their faith in Christ yes God promises to rescue them but some of them will die because Paul says whether we live or die we to the Lord 
whether we live or we die we belong to the Lord we are his subjects he has ownership of us he has us we belong to him in absolute surrender whether it's through death or whether it's through life we belong to God here I am do to me as it seems good to you whether it's starting three services, whether it's generously giving, whether it's serving, whether it's living with passion for God. Here I am. Do to me as it seems good to you. If a snake comes to your garden and said, has God said, you said, devil, let me stop you there. He is your God, but he is my Lord. And he said, and he settles it, and I believe him. And therefore, devil, get out of my garden. Devil, get out of my family. Get out of my situation. Why? Because he is your God, but he is my Lord God. He is my Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. You might be going through today what lepers were going through. And I love what they said when they met Jesus. They said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on water. Yes, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Blind, uh, the father with the special needs child and, and also demonized child. He says, Lord, have mercy on my son. Blind man said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Jesus says go find a donkey and when they say what are you doing he says Lord the Lord needs them Matthew 22 37 love the Lord your God mm. pray to the Lord of the harvest the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath the most beautiful part about his Lordship is when you submit to it he takes not only ownership he always is responsible for what he owns and then you have not only the right, the privilege, Lord, heal me. Why? I'm your property. I'm your possession. My body is yours. My life is yours. Lord God, heal me. That means I acknowledge your Lordship. I acknowledge your sovereignty. I acknowledge your power over my life. Do to me what seems good to you to overcome temptation never let the devil take you out of the realm umbrella and protection of the Lord God